moment, ladies, without further ado, I will present to you Headmaster of Lower Canada College, good friend, proud Selwyn House old boy, Mr. Chris Shannon. Uh, and it was to cancer. 
Last June, he was given a surprising terminal diagnosis because here was a guy who, in his years, and I'll describe him uh, in a minute, but he was not very athletic. He had five brothers, we were all quite athletic. He was not athletic. Uh, and later in life, he became a bit of a fitness freak. And probably last June, he was fitter, much fitter than me. Uh, he, was in, he was working with a personal trainer three days a week. He had a whole routine in terms of fitness, being a man in his mid-50s, about you know being able to be healthy and, and be able to live a longer life. He received a diagnosis last June, early June, that he had nine to 12 months to live. It was inoperable. There could be some what they call palliative treatment that could maybe ease some of the suffering, but none of it would do much in terms of extending his life. Uh, he was given nine to 12 months and he unfortunately lasted only eight months. We were five brothers. So we asked David, David, what's on the bucket list? Is there a bucket list? Can you formulate a bucket list? And he was very clear, there's nothing. I have one thing. He simply wanted to hang out with his brothers. He wanted to hang out with our families, his, our kids, his nieces and nephews, who he loved and adored. So after uh, some very intentional summer holiday time in Maine together, and some other times together, I went to Toronto frequently. All four of my brothers have done the Montreal back in the 70s, it was post uh, PQ, etc. There was quite a diaspora who found themselves in, in Toronto, and all four of them lived there. I was in Toronto uh, at least every second weekend, if not every weekend, to visit with him and spend some time in the fall. Uh, and I also hosted David here in Montreal, where he, uh, again, intentionally gathered his closest friends so he could be with them and literally say his last goodbyes. Think about that for a minute. What would you say? He knew, it was, it was uh, quite something to be with somebody who knew that he was gonna leave this world and there was literally nothing he could do about it and he met with friends to say his last goodbyes. I assure you though, if that one, if his bucket list was one thing and that was to spend time together, I think we maximized it. We, we did in his, in his months, his eight months, have a fantastic time together. And David and I were particularly close. I'm the third of the, of the five. They say that those of us in the middle, some of you here are middle children. Uh, you know, sometimes they refer to you as the forgotten middle, but I think we're bridge builders. It's who we are. I'm in education, that's my job, build bridges, help bring people together. Uh, and David and I were particularly close. We were probably the closest out of the five in terms of our relationships. In fact, he's somebody in my life who I really admired for many, many reasons. And to be honest, I admiration and respect were probably the best words to describe my relationship with him. And in fact, to be more precise, deep admiration and deep respect. So I'm proud to be able to speak about him today, but I will, in front of you, acknowledge that it is very difficult. His loss is still raw for me, as it is for all of my brothers. So yes, David played an important role in my life because we were, he was one of my four brothers, but he was notably different from the rest of the brothers because he was my only gay brother. Growing up, you think about it back in the 70s in a boys school like this, he stood out in lots of ways from his peers, but not just because of his flaming red hair and his eventual sexual orientation, being gay and different from the majority of the 1970s and the 80s, his journey into adulthood was not easy. In those days, Canadian society, as you probably know, was much more conservative, less open to difference and diversity, and much less inclusive. We talk a lot about inclusivity, inclusivity these days. I don't really remember talking about it as a, as a teenager. As a boy and as a teenager, it was hard for him to have all of the important, difficult questions answered. Who were the trusted gay role models? He couldn't find the authority figures and mentors who understood his situation. They were few and far between. And think of it, because I know for you young men, it is shocking to realize there was no such thing called the internet. So finding out about such topics was quite difficult in terms of finding those who would share and to do research. And yes, because of a lot of his mannerisms, his interests, 
He was not into sports. He was into things that were a little different from the standard. He found that life was difficult when he was indeed picked on and harassed, and he was picked on and harassed. Especially being in a boys' school in the 1970s, where jocks, testosterone, and a veneer of toughness truly ruled the day. Simply stated, the teen years were challenging for David. Quick sidebar, I came to work in Montreal at LCC in 2005, and it was in August of 2005, via stance at college where I was ahead for six years. I was alone. We have a house in Prince Edward Island, a summer place. My family was there. I had come to do work in the, in the first of August. Um, we were temporarily, temporarily lodged, actually, in a, in a, we were going through a transition. We purchased a house. It wasn't ready till December. And we moved into a furnished apartment right across the street on Stanton Street, where I could keep an eye on Selwyn House just to make sure what's going on as I moved into my new school. On my very first night, uh, I walked over to Green Avenue, as I had actually, after many, many years, come back to my city, to Montreal, and I knew I could find a, a bite to eat over there, and I ran into a Sullivan House grad who I barely recognized, but I eventually did recognize, and he was a classmate of my brother David's at Sullivan, and here's what he said to me. Hey, Christian, I haven't seen you in 25 years. It's like I went up for milk in this case. I haven't seen you in 25 years. That time you, the last time I saw you, you grabbed me by the throat, pushed me up against a locker, and looked right in my face and said, leave my brother alone. You know, it was the right thing to do. Let me buy you dinner. And we went and had dinner. So enough about schoolboy justice from the 1970s. I want to go back to David. Not surprisingly, it was a very big step for my brother to eventually come out, as they say, and identify as gay in public to his peers and to the world. Beyond the small number of family and close friends where we knew this, the public coming out was difficult. But standing tall and defining his own true identity was so important to him that he eventually developed the courage after he did this to help so many others come out and do the same. In fact, he eventually wrote a weekly Archer on issues in the gay community in a popular community magazine known as the Montreal Mirror. He wrote a column which has become a bit of legend called Out in the City. He regularly advised legions of young and older Montrealers in those columns on a litany of issues about being gay, about ranging from trends to legal to health and other concerns, and he wrote it weekly for seven years. And his columns actually became required readings of Montrealers who wanted to be up on issues that were contemporary, especially gay Montrealers. And since David's passing is just two months, I have received literally hundreds of requests, specifically from the gay community, to gather and publish his articles into a book. They were beautifully written, they were insightful, they were often very courageous, and they were often just plain sassy. David also hosted a weekly radio show, and if you think about this at a time when talking about gay issues was really considered to be not necessarily dummy God, he opened, he had a radio show that specifically addressed and demystified issues for members of the LGBTQ community, and so that absolutely no one mixed up what he was about or what his show was about, he simply named it The Homo Show. It was well known in the city. To the point that after having done it for a few months, I would walk with David in downtown Montreal in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, and people would recognize David, they would stop him, and they would thank him for his work, his positions, the open sharing of his views, and David became a very public figure in Montreal. And at one point, he became the leading voice in the gay community in the city, but actually, it was not something he signed up for, and he would describe himself as a reluctant leader. He became so well known that the tragedy of uh, that funny technique when 14 women were gunned down in this city for being women, because that's what the killer said, why he did what he did. The, uh, David received a lot of hate because it brings these people out of the woodwork, right? When things like this happen, there was a lot of hate mail, hate calls, and the police here in Montreal, because he had the most public profile as a gay man in the city, said, we really do recommend you try and get out of the city for a month or so and let the dust settle a little bit. 
For you young men, a little bit of modern history I think is required. In the early 1980s, the gay community suffered enormously during the early days of the AIDS crisis across North America. Gay men were disproportionately infected and dying in significant numbers by the tens of thousands. And the problem, this plague as it became known, was made worse by a lot of myths and rumors about AIDS and how it was transferred from one person to another. This is where my brother showed even greater courage beyond just being a commentator. He continued his media presence and public commentaries, but he also stepped up by actively supporting the sick and the dying and by doing things as a volunteer. And when language politics got in the way here in Montreal and threatened the, to limit health care availability to many people who were in need despite their language, mother tongue, Vader took further action. He was one of the founders of ACCA, ACCM, which is AIDS Community Care Montreal. He started that organization. It is the only multilingual support group in Montreal that offers health and counseling uh, and medical services to anybody suffering from AIDS regardless of mother tongue, eth ethnic or economic background. And today, I'm proud to say that it is the largest AIDS support agency in our city. So he's left behind a legacy. David didn't do this from the sidelines. He immersed himself. He literally died with people. That's what he did. Um, by offering comfort and personal palliative care. And palliative care is the care we give to people as they're in their dying days, when we know they are literally going to die and we try and help them die with comfort. He offered personalized palliative care to dozens of men affected by AIDS, who had been shunted by friends, by their families sometimes, and by a healthcare system when they were left on their own. It was indeed a very dramatic time. David was also one of the founding members of the Montreal chapter of an activist group, originally founded in New York City, called ACT UP. Members were relentless in challenging politicians and the medical community. They made sure that funding was enhanced, medical treatment was more patient-focused, and they used creative tactics that garnered attention nationally and actually globally, including interrupting and stalling the World's AIDS Conference here in Montreal in the summer of 1989. And David was one of its leading tacticians. I received a very, very meaningful communique, an email from a woman who is a Canadian uh, medical journalist who said that David's work with ACT UP changed the view of how the medical community addressed AIDS to make it much more patient-centered rather than just crunching numbers to think about how to do best. Uh, so so it, was, it was great satisfaction to see something like that. During this period, my brother became a principal spokesperson for the gay community in Montreal. And again, not because he wanted to, but his peers pulled him into leadership role because of his knowledge, his passion, his strong media profile. And he met frequently with political, religious, police, and medical leaders. He continues to openly advocate for equity, for diversity, and inclusion through his regular newspaper columns and the radio show. And along the way, I witnessed and learned a great deal from him about courage, just simply by watching him in action the courage to do things that a lot of us would have probably said, no, that somebody else will do that. He also taught me to better respect how difficult it can be for young people with non-traditional gender and sexual orientation and all others simply struggling with identity issues. Thankfully, I think much has changed, but being a teenager is still about being a teenager and emerging into a sense of identity and being yourself, whatever that self will be. Uh, in schools, we have become much more proactive in promoting education and dialogue around gender and sexual orientation. We've taken important steps, I think, that were severely lacking before. I specifically want to thank, actually, and I don't know who in the room is in this role, I think I know one, but uh, I want to thank our school counselors. I think your role has become much more important. Uh, you were instrumental, my school as well, in the important role helping uh, students as you struggle with your sense of identity. And it's okay. I mean, in today's day and age, working with counselors is a wonderful thing. They're very helpful people. Uh, I don't think we had any counselors at school when I was here. You just had to suck it up and get on with it. Uh, but the creation of gay straight alliances in school, and we have one too, uh, I'm told they haven't had a chance, but I would really love to see yours and ours, uh, our group, your one house group, and our equivalent at LCC get together and, and think about how to do things together. And the reason is that wellness does really matter for everybody. 
And it is very important that we have safe space, safe spaces to help students learn and, support, and be supported uh, during certain times of adolescence. And in reality, our teen years are an evolving into exploration for each of you. I get that. You're learning and defining your identity. And actually, it is just as important, in my view, if you are straight, to have the courage to openly be an ally as it is uh, to join the uh, one house or the equivalent in any other school um, if you aren't straight. But I would suggest you do not use my 1970s technique of finding justice by grabbing people by the throat up against the lockers. It's not really the best way to do it. So all of you spend a lot of time in school, uh, and I think it's really very important, and it's maybe nice that you're, uh, you're, you're out of school and others have somebody else here to remind you that this needs to be a place for everybody. It needs to be a place for everybody to be accepted, to be comfortable, to be valued. Every single person in this room, you're part of a community, you all contribute to that notion of a, a safe and supportive school. Uh, and, and like me, I hope you can find yourself as somebody who wants to be an ally to peers, especially those who may be struggling with issues related to gender identity or sexual orientation. You may not be familiar with an internet, an internet activist who in 2010 began a hugely successful online campaign directed at gay youth, especially boys and girls in very small communities who were being suffocated and marginalized by strict conservative social dogma. Dan Savage's online resources became a valuable outlet for gay youth all across North America, starting in 2010, still the case. And for those here who are perhaps struggling with your own sense of identity, I would like to repeat Dan Savage's important mantra, and one that I know if my brother David were here today to talk about his own life, he would share, and it is very simple. It will get better. Yes, over time, things will get better as you become a young adult and an older adult. And I hope that every person in this room will be contributing to you feeling a greater sense of comfort and acceptance so that you will always be seen for your strengths, your attributes, and much that you have to contribute. Also, as a starting point, I think for all students, forget sexual orientation. As each of you navigate the sometimes turbulent waters of adolescence, I repeat a simple but important statement that a visitor with AIDS told my school community several years ago in an assembly that I noted had real resonance with the students. This is somebody who, in a world where, unfortunately, uh, kids are trying to figure out, what do I need to be? And you know, one thing that you, you, you can never be is perfect. And there's a lot of pressure on you to try and uh, seek to be really, really great at certain things. And he said simply, quote, no matter who you are, or what your sexual orientation, you are enough. Just as you are today, all of you are enough. So that's something that I think that we all need to remember and come to terms with as we aspire to get better, but we will never, ever seek or attain perfection. And I also thank my brother for helping me gain a better appreciation in practical ways for the importance of diversity, for equity, for inclusion, and for support if we're truly to call ourselves a community as opposed to a place where we just get together. It's made a real difference in my life as an educator. I also hope that by sharing a little bit of David's story with you this morning, I may have given you a reason as you took a minute of quiet, and then maybe you'll take another minute of quiet some other time, to pause and reflect on how do you actually, in action, do something to build a better community and strengthen the sense of inclusiveness in this school, and when you go beyond this school to some the next place that you go, whatever community you go into, how will you celebrate inclusiveness, diversity in all its forms? So hopefully David's life as a Sullivan grad has inspired you in some small measure to take some uh, action where needed. And I ask you to remember that by extension, you are all his brothers. Nice little bit.